reproductive endocrinology key points. This video will summarize part of chapter 16 from William Gynecology, which includes the hypothalamic pituitary axis, menstrual cycle, and the endometrium. Normal female reproductive function require integration between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland in the brain, the ovaries, and the endometrium inside the uterus. The hypothalamus secretes GnRH, which stimulates the anterior pituitary glands to produce gonadotropins, I mean FSH and LH. Gonadotropin will stimulate the ovary to perform two functions. Number one, it produces follicles, known as folliculogenesis. It also produces hormones. There are two types of hormones. Steroid hormones, I mean estrogen and progesterone, and also it produces peptide hormones like inhibin. Steroid hormones will prepare the endometrium for implantation. In addition, it affects the hypothalamus and pituitary glands, known as feedback effects. Initially, it's a negative feedback effect. However, with a larger amount and longer duration of estradiol release, it switches into a positive feedback effect, inducing LH surge. On the other side, the peptide inhibin has a negative feedback effect on the pituitary glands. Now let's discuss each compartment in some details. Starting with the hypothalamus and pituitary glands, they are located at the base of the brain. The hypothalamus contains 11 major nuclei. It controls the anterior and posterior pituitary glands. It sends hormones to the anterior pituitary gland through the hypophyseal portal circulation. So the anterior pituitary gland will produce hormones and release hormones. On the other side, the posterior pituitary gland is a neural tissue, consists of axon terminals that arise from the periventricular nucleus and supraorbital nucleus. Hormones are formed in the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary gland, so the posterior pituitary glands release hormones only. It does not synthesize hormones. The hypothalamus releases gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, known as GnRH, which stimulates the anterior pituitary to release gonadotropins, I mean FSH and LH. It secretes TRH to produce TSH. Gross hormone-releasing hormone will stimulate gross hormone release from the anterior pituitary. Corticotropin-releasing hormone will stimulate ACTH from the anterior pituitary. While dopamine from the hypothalamus will inhibit prolactin release from the anterior pituitary. As you see, all these four hormones are stimulatory, while dopamine is inhibitory. In addition, somatostatin inhibits gross hormone release. In addition, the two hormones of the posterior pituitary, I mean vasopressin and oxytocin, are formed in the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary. They only released from the posterior pituitary. Regarding GnRH, it is released from the arteriot nucleus. It is a decapeptide, I mean the form of 10 amino acids. It has a short half-life, less than 10 minutes. In fact, it's 2 to 4 minutes. It is released in a pulsatile manner. As you see, in the first half of the menstrual cycle, I mean the follicular phase, it is more frequent and low amplitude. While in the other half of the menstrual cycle, it is less frequent with high amplitude. It binds to GnRH receptors on gonadotropins to trigger the release of FSH and LH. Modification of amino acid sequence of GnRH will produce GnRH analogs. A change in amino acid number 6 will produce GnRH agonists, while a change in amino acid number 1, 2, 3, and 6 will produce GnRH antagonists. Continuous administration of GnRH analog will result in pituitary downregulation. I mean, they will prevent the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary glands. Regarding the anterior pituitary glands, it contains five hormone-producing cells. Gonadotropes secretes gonadotropins, lactotropes secretes prolactin, somatotropes for gross hormone, cyrotropes for TSH, and adrenocorticotropes, 
which secretes ACTH. FSH, LH, TSH, and HCG are glycoproteins composed of alpha and beta subunits. Alpha subunit is identical, while beta subunit is specific for each hormone. The half-life of LH is 30 minutes, while the half-life of FSH is several hours. All hormones secreted from the anterior pituitary gland are stimulated by hypothalamic hormones, except for prolactin. It is inhibited by dopamine secreted from the hypothalamus. Certain factors can increase prolactin release. These include TRH, cyrotropin-releasing hormone, vasopressin, endogenous opioids, and acetylcholine. TRH, specifically, it stimulates TSH secretion, and also it is a potent prolactin release. And this explains the relation between hypothyroidism and hyperprolactinemia. The half-life of circulating prolactin is 20 to 30 minutes. Damage to the pituitary stock, which connects between the hypothalamus and pituitary glands, will result in hypopituitarism. I mean all hormones will decrease. Except for prolactin, its level will increase. The second organ is ovary. The ovary has two functions, folliculogenesis and hormone production. The smallest follicles in the ovary are called primordial follicles. They are formed of a primary oocyte surrounded by a single layer of granulosa cells, flattened granulosa cells. And the primary oocyte is arrested in the first meiotic division. I mean, it started meiosis 1, but didn't complete it. The primordial follicle will grow to form primary follicles. Primary follicles, the primary oocyte is slightly larger, and the flat granulosa cells become cuboidal. This step does not require FSH, I mean it is FSH independent. With the rising level of FSH at the beginning of the cycle, the primary follicle will grow more. I mean the primary oocyte will grow, and the number of granulosa cell layers around the primary oocyte will increase. And another layer called zona pellucida will form around the primary oocyte. Next, fluid will accumulate between granulosa cells called antrum. And the follicle increase in size and called secondary follicle. The antrum will grow more. The granulosa cells now are arranged in two parts. A part surrounds the oocyte called cumulus and other parts called mural granulosa cells. And the theca cells form the outer part of the follicle. Now it's called tertiary follicle. The increasing amount of estradiol will switch the negative feedback effect into a positive feedback effect, which results in LH surge. LH surge will resume meiosis. I mean the primary oocyte arrested in meiosis 1 will continue meiosis 1 to form secondary oocyte, just immediately before ovulation. LH surge also will trigger ovulation. Now the released secondary oocyte is surrounded by zona pellucid and a layer of granulosa cell known as corona radiate. The other function of the ovary is to produce steroid hormones. This requires two cells, I mean theca cell and the granulosa cell, and two hormones, LH and FSH. That's why it's called two-cell, two-gonadotropin theory. Theca cell under the effect of LH will convert cholesterol into androstenedione. It doesn't contain aromatase enzyme to convert androstenedione into estrogen. So this androstenedione travels to the nearby granulosa cell, which under the effect of FSH will convert androstenedione into estradiol. The ovary also produces peptide hormones. Inhibin will decrease gonadotrop function. Activin will stimulate gonadotropin function. Folistatin will decrease gonadotropin function indirectly by inhibiting the action of activin. Inhibin B is secreted in response to FSH in early follicular phase, while inhibin E is controlled by LH during the luteal phase. And lastly, regarding the endometrium, it has two layers, 
basalis and the functionalis layer. The basalis layer is adjacent to the myometrium and remains relatively stable throughout the menstrual cycle. The functionalis layer sheds during menstruation and it is formed of two sublayers, the stratum compactum, a superficial layer which contains a glands neck and dense straw. The deeper layer is called the stratum spongiosum and it contains glands and loose straw. During the proliferative phase, which corresponds to the follicular phase of the ovary, after menstruation the endometrium is 1 to 2 mm thick. But estrogen will stimulate rapid proliferation of glandular and stromal cells in the functionalis layer. During this proliferative phase, the glands proliferate and the cell lining the glandular lumen undergoes stratification. However, the stroma remains compact during this phase. By the time of LH surge, the endometrial thickness reaches approximately 12 mm and it does not increase significantly after that. During the secretory phase, which corresponds to the luteal phase of the ovary, secretory changes occur after ovulation. The glands become more tortuous and the stroma more edematous. A spiral arteries increase in number and coiling throughout the luteal phase. Cells lining the glands develop glycogen-rich vacuoles. Progesterone will stimulate these vacuoles to move from the basal part of the cells to the superficial part to release their secretion inside the lumen of the glands. The peak of secretory process occurs around post-ovulatory day 6, which coincides with the day of implantation. Now the endometrium is ready for implantation. However, if a plastocyst fails to implant, the corpus luteum degenerates and the form corpus albicans, progesterone level will decrease. This drop in progesterone level will result in collapse of the endometrial glands. In addition, polymorphinuclear leukocytes and the monocytes will infiltrate the endometrium. Spiral arteries constrict, causing local ischemia. Lysozyme will release proteolytic enzyme that accelerate tissue destruction. And also prostaglandins are important, especially prostaglandin F2 alpha, which results in arterial spasm and myometrial contraction. These effects will result in menstruation. During the menstruation, the entire functionalis layer of the endometrium exfoliates, only the basalis layer remain, and after menstruation, re-epicellialization of the discomated endometrium begins within two to three days. Thank you.